Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be able to come down and talk to you. It's glad we're able to get such a good turnout today. Uh, as was said, my name is Hugh Martin, and uh, I was the organic specialist with OMAFRA for over 30 years. Uh, now working as a consultant, doing some other miscellaneous type things, still very much involved in organic. But as an agronomist, certified crop advisor, I'm going to try to concentrate more on some of the agronomy aspects of organic. And so that's kind of where I'm going to go today. Now, this is a slide here of a soybean field. This is an organic field. Uh, probably a little too perfect for weed control because not all fields are going to look that way. Um, but certainly uh, it was organic there, still is organic. And uh, you can do it. One of the things I wanted to put up first is kind of to talk about some of the um, markets for organic and James talked about that at the start and I've upgraded it here a little bit. And as you take a look back uh, 97, I guess it is, uh, you can see how there's been pretty well steady growth. This line here is the annual uh, growth which is running about 15-20% up until about 2009 when the bottom dropped out of the market, but we never went below about 5% annual growth is now up around 10%. This is 2011. I ha haven't got the numbers for 2012 yet, uh, but in 2011 globally we had about 62 billion of sales of organic. Uh, North America it was around 31 or 2 as I've got there, plus Canada is another couple billion, probably about 2.6. And uh, the growth is, is continuing around that 10% rate, probably closer to 15 when you get into fruits and vegetables. So definitely there is uh, opportunities with organic. And a good example of that is with the, the chicken. One of the meat sectors, or the meat sector is one of the faster growing areas of organic. These are some historic uh, prices for grains over the last, what, 10 years, I guess. These I took off the Homestead Organic uh, site, uh, website that Tom Manley keeps. And it gives you a pretty good idea as to where prices have been. We come along pretty steady in this period here, and then they kind of shot up except for this dip that took place in 2009 and 10, um, 11. But we have now come up to the top and probably towards next fall, trending down a little bit right now, not a whole lot, still higher than it was. If you look at soybeans down here, both the food and feed prices, much the same kind of story. You get some static from year to year, ups and downs, so you got to be prepared for that. As a rule of thumb, organic prices are going to be roughly double what conventional prices are going to be. But that's not definitive. When you take a look at organic prices, they're not based on Chicago. We're not looking at the Chicago Board of Trade price plus 50% or 100% or whatever number. It's all based on supply and demand and it will vary. There was a period a couple years ago where things actually got pretty close between conventional and organic. You go back 10 years ago, soybeans were triple the price of conventional. So it does vary with supply and demand. Corn is probably very good right now. Uh, wheat still hasn't caught up from that recessionary dip that took place a couple years ago, but these things are improving. One of the things with organic prices is you can't Look on the internet, you can't do a price discovery real easy onto it except by keeping in touch with your buyers. So if you're used to selling to the same buyer, that's great, you always got one phone call to make. But there are, I don't know, I'll say half a dozen buyers in the market in Ontario, something like that. And um, they've all got their daily opportunities, so it's a matter of whenever you got some you want to sell, you touch base with them to see, well, what are prices doing this week? And uh, they're all used to that. Then when they need corn, like they do right now, uh, sometimes they call you and say, if you got another 10,000 bushel I can get or another truckload I can get. That kind of stuff goes on. What really helps with organic is if you've got grain bins or you've got a way of storing it so you can sell it as you can get into those market opportunities. 
If you don't have storage, if you have to dump it on the market off the combine, you probably won't get top dollar for your, for your grain. But certainly that is best if you've got access to some storage and for corn especially, that may, need, may mean having some drying of some sort. So those are ways of trying to maximize your opportunity into the market. Now, what I'm going to do for most of the rest of my presentation is talk about, I've used the word challenges, we had opportunities, now we'll talk about challenges, that's kind of the way a lot of people look at it, but you can put in whatever word you want. But some of the issues I put in here is the whole certification transition, that's probably one of the first challenges people get into. And then you'll get into weeds, market demand, drying storage capacity. These last points here basically all come from a survey that was done with a group of grain farmers from Quebec. And when they asked them, what are your biggest constraints, was the way they phrased it, uh, in organic grains, this was how they come up with the answers. Was it 60% that indicated weeds? And that's probably conservative from a lot of the farmers I've talked to. Weeds are definitely the number one issue. Next along the line there is market demand, and it's a matter of, again, having the storage, being able to know the price to sell at, uh, drying capacity maybe for some crops. And then you get into soil fertility, input cost, uh, available land base. They've got time restraints in here, and notice profitability is last on the list. And maybe that's, I'm not sure what year this survey was done, it may be on how things were at the time. Certainly profitability was a bit of an issue a couple years ago when prices were low. Uh, one of the other things talked about available land base, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it through the rest, is if you're going to invest the time in transition, and John's done a pretty good assessment as to you're going to have to pay some tuition for a couple years to get into it, to learn the new system. That's an investment in that property, so you're going to want a long-term lease on that if you're renting it. Um, and I've known cases where people went ahead, transitioned the property, things were going along fairly good for a couple of years, and then suddenly soybean prices went to what they thought might be $15, so they come in and offered 200 an acre, and the guy lost the farm. And we get those kind of things. You want to somehow or other be able to lock down some long-term tenure on that property. And that is one of the challenges for some guys, unless you own it, is to be able to know where you're at in the future. Now some people are talking about certification and the question, I'll try to cover off part of that. One of the aspects of certification is that it requires uh, inspection every year. Um, so that you can try to uh, be certified. But in terms of transition, that first inspection, or you've got to apply for certification 15 months before you plan to sell your first organic product. So let's say you want to grow soybeans, you know you're going to be harvesting them in October. So in your transition year, which is the year before that, you want to apply for that at least 15 months, and I would suggest more than that, uh, before that so that they can review your paperwork, get out there with an inspector and inspect that when the crop is growing in the field the year before you're doing your actual certification. Um, the other thing that goes with it is you've got to adhere to those organic standards for 36 months before harvesting that organic crop. So you've got to have a 36 month transition period, the next slide I'll show you what that can look like, where you're maintaining these things and you've got to keep track of what you've done during that 36 months. In organic, you've got to maintain what they call an organic plan. And it's really just pretty good records as to what you're doing in terms of tillage, what your seed, where'd your seed come from, what are you doing for weed control, how are you managing your tillage, your uh, row cultivation, et cetera, et cetera, your harvest procedures, storage procedures, all of those sort of things are kind of written down your application form really forms that organic plan in a lot of cases because it, it steps you through the steps of, of what are you doing on the farm. They want to know so they can make sure that you're following the standards, but also it does, it's a pretty good guideline as to keeping track of 
here's what I'm, I'm doing on the farm. A lot of farmers typically keep pretty a lot of that in their head. They have the financial and, and some of that stuff written down. In this case, there's a little extra written down. You get the annual inspection by the inspector that will come out after you apply to see what's going on. And they're going to be looking at all your fields, whether they're organic or not, if part of your farm's organic. Your sales records, doing an inspection of the facilities, so your input documents, uh, where'd you get that seed? Was it treated seed or is it GMO, whatever? Uh, field history comes in play, particularly on fields that are coming into the operation, having an affidavit as to what the last three years have been done to that field. One of the issues with organic is no parallel production. In other words, you can't grow the same variety, both organic and non-organic. Let's say you've got a thousand acre farm, you want to bring a hundred into organic. You're growing soybeans, so what you do is on your organic, you maybe grow white hylum soybeans, and on your non-organic, you can grow dark hylum. Or if it's wheat, it can be red and white wheat. Corn's a little bit trickier because it's hard to get visual distinguishability on the grain, but it's just a matter of managing your crops so that you're not doing the same thing both ways. Um, yeah, the other thing is on all inputs you're using in your organic system, be it during the transition period or during the organic period, got to be approved by the certification body. And don't take the word of the salesman that, yeah, it's okay on organic. Make sure you talk to the certification body to make sure that they have approved it. Because what happens sometimes is that product that was out there last year was fine. It was proven organic. But they've done something to tweak the formula. And we all remember the commercials, new and improved tide or whatever. Well, sometimes they tweak these products and they're no longer approved. Or the standards slightly have changed somewhat. So you have to be aware of that. In transition, what you want to do is, let's say you've got a field last year was conventional. So you use your normal fertilizers, herbicides in June whatever. So this year you want to go organic, so 2013 is your T1 year, first year transition. You're going to grow it as if it was organic, but you've got to sell it as conventional unless you can find one of the transitional markets around. There's a few of those, but you've got to talk to the right people to find one, and the price is not going to be as good as organic. Then in 2014, basically the same thing. This is the year you would have to apply for certification uh, as transitional. So you're growing organic cell conventional for two years. In your third year, assuming that nothing was done after the early spring, early summer period, and you're growing something like corn and soybeans, you probably can sell it as organic because you'll have your 36 months in. You got to grow it as organic, but it depends. If that last year you done something in the fall, Let's say last fall you use Roundup, well then you got to wait till 36 months after that before you can come in and become certified. 2016, you should have your 36 months in by then, so you're fully organic. So that's the way a transition program would work out. Any questions on that concept of the certification transition? Okay, well let's get into everybody's favorite topic. Talk a bit about weeds. In a lot of presentations, I used to have some slides I would put up and I'd ask people, how do you control weeds? And of course, if you talk to most people, especially conventional farmers, you ask them, how do you control weeds? The first answer is something that comes out of a jug. But with organic farmers, you don't have that option. And I would have a list of, I think it's about 50 items that farmers can do to control weeds on their farm. And those are the tools that organic farmers have to use. And these are some of them here, there's lots of others. Crop rotation is one of the number one things you can do to control wheat, especially if you're including cover crops. So after the wheat or the barley's off, whatever, you've got a cover crop there that prevents those weeds from getting going and going to seed, whatever. Maybe you're going into that red clover after the wheat and mowing it to try to help knock it down. Uh, if you're after a hay crop, you may have a little bit of a problem getting rid of the perennial grasses, but most of the annual weeds are going to be maintained as part of that rotation. So those are things that come in as part of that. 
Most organic farmers are using conventional tillage of one sort or another. It may not be the moldboard plow, it may be some other type of plow they're using, but they're using some kind of primary tillage in the fall or spring and then following up with secondary tillage to try to help keep those weeds down. And so that is basically part of most farms. Before the, after the crop is planted, but before uh, it comes up, you're probably going to go in and do a harrowing or rotary hoeing to uh, try to knock some of the seedling weeds out. Once you can see that weed from the road, it's way too big for the rotary hoe or basically once it's over a half inch or an inch high, it's too big for those tools. Road cultivation comes in then to try to get them. Um, but again, it's a matter of having that equipment and being able to do it. For spring cereals, relatively easy. Plant them early and you can avoid most of the weeds there. Uh, corn, soybeans, you're going to plant them later than usual. If you're used to planting early May, uh, this area may be mid-May, you're probably going to be planting last week of May with organic, maybe in the first couple of days of June even, because by then you can go in, work that field in, as soon as you can get out there, late April, early May, wait till that first flush of weeds come back, work it again, knock that down, and then you let that grow for another week or so and you come in, knock that down with the cultivator and then you uh, plant. So you've already knocked off two flushes of weeds before you ever plant. You plant, you'll get some little weeds starting to grow up, mostly what we call white root stage. Come in with your rotary hoe, kind of work them out a bit. Crop comes up, you wait another week or so, hit them with the rotary hoe or weeder harrow again. And then a couple weeks later, you come in with the cultivator a couple times. And that is very quickly a synopsis for corn or soybeans. One of the other things is to increase your seeding rate, at least 25 or 50 percent. And I'm finding some of the good guys are certainly going above the 25 percent. When you go in with the weed or harrow a few times, the inner row cultivation, we do get a little what I call iron toxicity, where you tend to kick them out a little bit. So you just make sure you got enough plants there to start with, but you want to get a good, quick moving canopy. And that's part of the reason of planting late. You wait till that soil warms up, get that crop off to a quick start, and it helps to smother out the weeds and get ahead of the weeds. Another thing with um, organic is make sure you're using clean seed. If you just back up to the bin and you put soybeans or, or barley into the planter out of the bin, and last year's crop had a lot of weeds into it, guess what you're planting back in the field? There's enough out there now. We don't need to plant more. So make sure you clean your seed. And for organic certification, you want to make sure you're Whoever your seed cleaner is, is doing a good job and they can be approved for uh, certified organic as well because you don't want to run your crop through right after they put Vitaflor or whatever they're using now through the seed cleaner. And except there will be some weeds. The perfect fields I showed you or that you may see later this afternoon, not everybody's going to get them. And every year be prepared to accept one field that's going to go totally backward on you just because you didn't get there on time. These are the three tools that are the mainstay of weed control, your weeder harrow, inner row cultivation, and your rotary hoe. There's also variations. Uh, here's one farmer who put two rotary hoes together on a bridge hitch and then on the front he's got the weeder harrow. So when you go across the field uh, you can decide which tools you want to use and go a couple times with that, it's far more aggressive. If your weeds are small, you should be able to get about 50% of the weeds that are emerging with each pass. So technically there you could get 75% by going with both rotary hoes. You can buy uh, hoe bits from uh, Manufar Manufacturing of Wheatley. They're, just, they're like little spoons that go on the end of the rotary hoe to make it more aggressive. And uh, uh, Manufarm Manufacturing at Wheatley, Ontario. It's an older fella that has been running this business for 25 or 30 years, I suppose. And uh, I'm not even sure what it costs. It's a fair bit of labor for you to do it yourself, which is what most people do, but it's cheaper than buying a whole new wheel.
you know, really extend the life and make them far more aggressive than even they were brand new. Which do you find more aggressive on the beans? The hair or rotary hoe? Depends on soil type to some degree. Um, and that I find the harrow does a pretty good job in, in loam or, or sandy soils on the clay. You probably need the rotary hoe to dig in a little better. As far as on the beans, um, again, that depends on stage of the beans. You don't want to go anywhere near them when they're, when they're coming up through and whatnot. But I think beyond that, I'll let Roger answer when he's up because he's going to be talking a bit more and he's, he's grew a lot more beans than I have. So <laughs> I'll, we'll kind of half park that question until he comes up. The other thing that some people will read about is the Rodale roller. And this is standing rye, whoops, standing rye here in front of the tractor. Uh, we're probably, what's that, June 3rd or something or other when this was done. He's got it mounted on the front forks of the loader. Uh, and I think that's a 15-foot roller and a 15-foot no-till drill. And he went in and rolled that and did nothing else. And he got off mid-40 bushel soybeans, hardly any weeds in the field. It worked very well that year. Year after, it worked very well. And then another year he tried it, it didn't work so well. Uh, very critical as to when you do it. You probably want to do it at what they call 50 to 75 percent pollination or probably about four or five days after heading. You do it too soon, the rye will regrow. If you don't use the right crimper to bend the stems right, it'll regrow. Uh, if you don't have enough rye population, if there's not enough straw flopped down on the ground or if it's not flopped down evenly, you'll get open pockets and you'll get weeds coming up in the bare patches. So there's a number of tricks to it that definitely can be done. Soil fertility. And somebody asked that question before, what can you use? First of all, all products got to be approved by your certification body. But for nitrogen, uh, legume crops are number one. Uh, if you can get, and you'll get anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds of nitrogen out of a good red clover crop, when some of the others are similar, uh, and also animanure or compost can be used. There's guidelines on those as well. But you can get a fair bit of nitrogen out of that. One of the problems with it for a crop like wheat is the soils are cold in the spring when the wheat normally is demanding a fair bit of nitrogen in May. And that is really hurting us on our wheat yields right now because we're not getting the nitrogen liberated, if you will, or available to the plant in time for it to use it. Corn's a little different, it can use it, it's a little warmer when it needs it in uh, around early July, late June, so we're able to use it. The phosphorus, animal manure compost, I find is best. Can use rock phosphate, but probably more expensive uh, for, based on availability and cost and whatnot, but certainly it can be used in places where you can't get manure. Potash, again, I like animal manure compost, but there's other products, potassium sulfate, sulpamag, uh, even muriate of potash can be used if you get the right formulation. Potassium chloride, potassium chloride muriate of potash, same thing. If you just go down to the elevator and get it from whoever you got in this area, Growmark or Cargill, whoever, they will have the standard brands of those things, but the, most of them have been treated with uh, surfactant, to increase flowability and reduce dust. And that surfactant's not allowed in organic, typically. So we've got to get the organic formulation that doesn't have the dust suppressant onto it. And those may or may not be available uh, depending on where you go. So you got to look around a little bit to get the right thing of that. Micronutrients, if you can use uh, animal manure compost, they're usually well endowed with micronutrients, so that helps you there. There are some of the sulfated uh, micronutrient products I think can be used as well, but definitely you'd want to make sure they're approved. There are some other fertilizer products coming on the market now uh, that would supply some of these other things. Again, you've got to look at the cost, you've got to look at what you need, and make sure they're approved. Uh, biggest challenge you've got is to try to reduce, close the loop to reduce your nutrient losses. Uh, you've got a lot of nutrient cycles, make sure you can keep them in the field rather than losing them to the creek. And continuous green crops as much as possible. 
I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago and they talked about reduce the brown. And uh, so it's that brown gap. You want to eliminate as much as possible in the field. Seeds, no GMO, none of the traditional seed treatments. There are a few seed treatments starting to be approved now for organic, but not many right now. Must use organic seed whenever it's available, but you can use non-organic seed if there is no organic seed available of that particular variety you want. You usually got to justify why you need that one versus another variety, and you got approval from your CB. One of the biggest factors of being successful organic is time management. How much time you got available? Can you set the priorities? When you're doing your weed control in June, well, what comes first? The hay that's out in the field or the weeds out in the cornfield or soybean field that you got to get after? If you're a weekend warrior that's basically only got Saturdays and Sundays to do it if it doesn't rain, it may not work that well. That is a challenge for some people. The other thing is, if you're counting on somebody else to do it custom work for you, have they got the time commitment to be able to do it when it needs to be done? So time management is ever so important on this. You've got to figure you're going to spend more time on the tractor. One of the farmers I heard speak at another conference this winter was comparing his 600-acre organic farm to the neighbor's 1,000-acre conventional farm, and he figured they had about the same amount of machine time in those two farms. They probably had about the same amount of net profit or return to themselves afterwards on those two farms, 600 versus 1,000. So that's one person's interpretation, but a bit of a guideline as to, yeah, you will spend more time on the tractor, but the workload will be a little more spread out because you're doing a little more stuff in early May, a little more stuff throughout June, a little more in July maybe. Uh, it'll keep you busy throughout the year. Uh, to me, red clover or whatever cover crop, you've got to manage it properly. So that's a little bit of time here and there. Uh, so you've got to plan on doing those things. And you'll probably have a little a little bigger machine shed for organic too because there's a lot of extra tools you're going to want to do the job properly. This is mostly the same data as what John showed you a few minutes ago because we had, or I shared my data with him a little bit before. Um, what I want to get down to is basically your net return to yourself and your land is basically yield by price minus cost. I'm calling a profit. He called it, I think, net return. These are some of the numbers based on prices from two weeks ago. And corn prices for organic has dropped a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Soybean prices has kind of up a little bit in the last couple of weeks. But let's just use these and, and go with it. So I'm showing organic corn at about a 627 advantage over conventional. Soybeans at about 95. Wheat is not quite going to make it right now, but we'll come back to that one. And I just threw barley in here as a comparison. You'll make a little bit on it, a little more than conventional. Now, we look at winter wheat. And some people might look at it and say, boy, I don't want to grow that wheat. It's going to lose me money. But very few farmers will grow red clover and not be able to get a good standard red clover on an organic farm. Now, how much is red clover, that opportunity of wheat afford you or even if you're growing barley, that red clover going to add to your crop rotation. It's probably going to add about 4 or 5% to the yields of the corn. And that's not the nitrogen. That is over and above the nitrogen benefit of 60 to 100 pounds the acre. It's going to add about 8% to the soybean yield, having that red clover in there to improve the soil structure. That's about $50 an acre for each of the corn and the soybeans. So suddenly, this number here of minus 44 goes to, let's call it plus 50, just by having that red clover in there. So suddenly wheat now, and this really is much the same on conventional if you can get good red clover, uh, your wheat is going to be worth a lot more than, than what you're in thinking if you just look at it as how much in and how much out because you've got a longer-term benefit. And the more you've got cover crops like red clover or there's a whole raft of them you can use. The more that's going to benefit your soils overall, 
to help bring them up to snuff, if you will, or to improve them so you can grow better crops. And that's part of the strategy of organic. So those numbers there, it, that's just one person's numbers. The yields are basically average organic yields that, uh, that we're getting in Ontario. Same with conventional. Over the last, I think I've got three year yields in there. Prices are fall prices. That's what you're going to expect when you at harvest, not what you got today. Um, so that's what it looks like right now. And the costs are basically John's numbers. So that basically is my presentation. I don't know how my time is on to it, how much time I got for questions. This is actually mustard. This is a cover crop. Now, how many here like mustard? And with cover crop of mustard, or oilseed radish, or a good many of the other buckwheat, good many of the other cover crops you would grow, you've got to manage them. You don't let them go to seed. Some would say as soon as you see a flower, you take it down. Uh, this case here, I think it was late enough in the fall, I wasn't too worried about seed set, but that is one of the things to keep in mind. So that's actually a good thing, to see that much yellow. So with that, I'll take questions till they take me off here. <laughs> Any questions?